Uh, joining us from the uh, University of California, Davis, Amelie Gaudin, and she will be talking to us about diverse uh, systems in the California context. So please welcome Dr. Amelie Gaudin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ali. I'm an agroecologist working at the University of California, Davis. Thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you about some of our work on soil health in diverse systems there in California. And thanks to Wayne for the beautiful introduction to some of the topics um, I, will, I will talk about. Um, OK, yeah, it is quick. Um, <laughs> So I was working in the Midwest before to move to California a couple of years ago. And uh, when, I, when I arrived to California, I was actually struck by the diversity of our cropping system. This is a picture taken yesterday on my flyout from Sacramento. And you can see that even in the winter, we have a tremendous crop diversity going on uh, across our landscape. Um, uh, actually, we have one of the most diverse and valuable cropping systems in the world, 300 to 400 crops growing continuously throughout the Central Valley. The Central Valley here, uh, uh, you can see it in, in, in brown. We have uh, nuts and fruit crops, uh, grape, berries, so a lot of perennial cropping systems. Vegetables, we are leading the nation in terms of lettuce and processing tomatoes. Uh, hay to feed the growing dairy industry. And field and field crops. Um, now, in terms of trends, um, uh, acreages in field and field crops have largely decreased over the last few years due to the rise in commodity prices and the allocation of very costly irrigation water to perennial crops. So nuts and fruit crops, grapes uh, and perennials in general have been rapidly expanding. Um, this has been a kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, this has pushed agriculture to the limit. Okay, this is the south of the Central Valley. We're pretty much in a desert, and you see almond production uh, pushing uh, pushed uh, uh, to the edge of of uh, the Central Valley. Uh, we've seen a, a rapid increase in in perennialization of our cropping systems, with very high density almond cropping systems being uh, uh, implemented all across the valley. And I'm saying it's a double-edged sword because it has created some potential concerns about water use and our flexibility with irrigation water supplies. Those trees have to be irrigated all year long. Um, but it has also provided an unprecedented opportunity to build up agroforestry system. We now have a lot of perennials in our landscape, a lot of orchards uh, that we could increase multifunctionalities from. And we also have livestock. Uh, from rendland to dairies, 18 uh, million acres of grasslands um, and a dairy uh, production uh, that remained the state's leading commodity, commodity and accounts for around 18% of um, the U.S. dairy products. Um, despite this very apparent diversity, um, systems are intensifying and are increasingly decoupling the Shine and Diversity Index in Yolo County just around uh, UC Davis has decreased a lot over the last 25 years. A lot of land in walnut, almonds, tomato, grapes, and the 25 other crops, actually just 18% of our uh, surface area planted. And we have an increased disconnect between forage feed production, animal production, and specialty <coughs> crop production, especially in terms of recycling of organic material and water. Water is our number one concern. Access to drinking water and irrigation water supply. And you see that this disconnect between the specialty crops and, um, and uh, dairy industries and, and, and livestock production in general can create some problem in terms of uh, water supply since most of the water use uh, in California is for hay, alfalfa, and in almond and pistachios. California is already experiencing uh, the impact of climate change. We've come, just came out of a five-year drought. Um, it's not looking very good for this year either. It still hasn't rained, okay? 
Um, we have had uh, wildfires uh, followed by mudslides. So uh, uh, drought cost agriculture industry a lot uh, in, in the Central uh, Valley. We also have concern about um, uh, uh, access to drinking water. This is from the Sacramento Bee yesterday. California can't wait longer for clean water. All in red is non-drinking, non, -drinking, non uh, uh, above limit drinking water. So a lot of communities do not have access to, to drinking water anymore. Our first environmental concern is water supply. Our second is that our soils are degrading. Um, almond production system, in almond, almond are harvested from the floor. They are swept up from the floor. You want a nice, clean, sterile soil, which is not good news for soil health. Uh, irrigation practices, why grow cover crop in California? Cover crop use water, evapotranspiration. How do we manage it so that, how do we balance this increase in infiltration and water retention with water use from, from cover crop? California growers do not want to irrigate a cover crop. Then we have food safety concerns. Uh, very low adoption of no-till, uh, animal integration in our systems. Uh, uh, late use production systems uh, are very uh, uh, scrutinized for E. coli, salmonella outbreak. So it's very hard to diversify those systems. And then climate, we're in the Mediterranean climate. We have very low carbon sink, uh, um, uh, very sandy soils as well. So uh, the government and, and um, uh, I've been moving on and the California Department for Food and Ag started a very aggressive healthy soil program with $7.1 million being distributed to researchers and producers in term for research and demonstration projects uh, related to soil health. Um, implementation of what we call carbon farming plans, which started in the grass, uh, the, the, the grazing and grassland communities and uh, is, is uh, spreading to uh, cropping systems. Uh, certain practices and counting, is, uh, including cereal pastures, uh, are being promoted as part of what we call carbon farming plans. And then the uh, ambitious new scoping plans, which has been released uh, and partially funded from the cap and trade money um, with uh, the goal of decre de decreasing our annual greenhouse gas emission to the level of 1990 by 2030. Um, we saw carbon sequestration uh, and recycling of organic matter on agricultural land is a central part of uh, this uh, scoping plan. So uh, soil health is, is at the center of, of our preoccupation and a lot of very good work has been done in California looking at um, rating fields and measuring impact of management um, um, on soil health and the three major pillar, the biological, chemical, and physical properties uh, using uh, uh, various indicators. In my lab, we've tried to actually go a little bit beyond that and think about what does it do? Because it's very hard for, for growers I talk to to kind of grasp, why should I improve my soil health? What's in it for me? Sequestering carbon is not sometimes something that, that will resonate with them. So we took a functional view to quantify the benefits to grower and the environment. And um, we uh, found that um, talking about resilience to stress and input use efficiency actually resonated a lot with, with growers. So we embarked on two projects, and I don't have the time to show you the extent of all the data. Um, but I will show you some nuggets of uh, some pieces of, of results and, and we can uh, talk some more uh, later. So we uh, investigated um, the impact of soil health on resilience to, to stresses. We, uh, the first one being an abiotic stress with uh, resilience to drought and irrigation water shortage. And the second one is to a biotic stress with the leaf hopper vector of the Bicholi top virus, which is a big problem in California. 
Um, and this research came about when I was in at the University of Guelph in 2012, and this was my trial. And uh, 2012 was one of the driest year of the last 30 years. And here we have a, a corn crop which is tilled, uh, grown in continuous crown, and one which is no-till, grown with a rotation of four crops and two cover crops. So you didn't need much statistics uh, to see that there is a difference in leaf rolling and, and water stress index in those two crops. So I went back and, and uh, worked um, some data coming out of the ELORA long-term rotational trials. Those long-term trials, as we I mentioned this morning, are a total gem. They are very, very important to be able to look at trends over time uh, and look at um, multiple sustainability uh, and economical outcome um, of healthier soil. This trial was established in 1980 and uh, compare, uh, a di has a diversity gradient going from continuous corn to a corn oat barley with two under seeded red clover uh, cover crop and uh, two tillage treatment, heavy till and conservation tillage. So soil health metrics are very different between uh, those, um, those treatments uh, with a difference in soil organic carbon and organic matter with uh, much more potential as minor mineralizable nitrogen. Uh, in the more diverse systems, uh, decrease in bug density, increase in aggregation stability, microbial uh, biomass. So um, we went back and looked at 30 years of data and uh, the diversification benefits overall is 9.6 bushel per acre in the teal, 6.8 bushel per acre in no teal. If you compare a corn soy system to a corn oat barley with different uh, red clover cover crops. Now in 2012, during a dry year, um, the, uh, the diversification benefits is actually much more. If you had a no-till system, you were yielding 26 bushel per acre more in this dry year compared to a, to a corn soy, um, uh, and 14 bushel per acre uh, in a till system, which is very significant when, when prices, uh, corn prices are, are up uh, during droughts. So and we analyzed uh, 30 years of data and found that yield stability significantly increased when corn and soybean were integrated in more diverse rotation. It was interesting because it increased the probability of harnessing favorable growing conditions as well while decreasing the risk of crop failure. So it seems to be a win-win situation. And in hot and dry years, diversification of these very simple rotation and reduced tillage increased yield by 7% in corn, uh, by 7% uh, in corn and 22% in soybean. So those are some very quantified metrics of um, uh, the impact um, that diversification uh, and greater soil health can have on, on drought resilience. Now we were, well, what if we stress those system out? Let's try to push the boundaries a little bit. So we went and put some rain out shelter in our corn rotation across a diversity gradient. Um, and uh, we found that yield increase uh, with healthier soil across water treatment. So you have corn soy, corn soy wheat, and corn soy oat barley with red clover. Uh, but we, found, we also found that yield loss due to drought decreased. This is the yield under drought relative to irrigated. And we found that uh, um, the stomatal conductance, the impact on stomatal conductance also uh, decreased, uh, resulting in smaller transpiration reduction due to drought in, in healthier soil. Now, this is the Midwest, temperate rain fed system, high carbon sink, um, focused around two summer crops. How does that translate to our systems in California, uh, where we are irrigated, uh, low carbon sink, and a very large crop um, diversity? Um, so I was working, I've been, I found a mentor, a, a grower mentor in California named Scott Park, um, and um, who let me play in his field and let me play with the irrigation water and try to kill this tomato crop. Um, and um, very kind of him. Um, and he has a neighbor who uh, he, they are competing uh, with each other, and he also lets me play in his field. Uh, Scott has very healthy soil. Here we got some metrics. He's certified organic, applied compost every year, brew his own microbes in, in his bathtub. Um, 
has yearly cover crops and a six-year uh, diversified rotation. And his neighbor, Jake, has a less healthy soil, conventional, doesn't apply compost, no cover crop, and just grow tomato cotton in general. Sometimes it's just monocrop um, tomato. Same variety, same soil, same irrigation, so kind of a, a very nice uh, comparative system. Um, so we went there and uh, measured soil water holding capacity. Scott's soil can hold way more water. And then we started to catch irrigation at different time points, try to stress out those systems um, in, in a replicated fashion. We found that uh, Scott used way less water than Jake and that when you start, this is the water productivity in tons of fresh weight of tomatoes per acre foot of water applied, um, that yield loss in, the orga in Scott's organic systems were lower um, when we started under deficit irrigation uh, and uh, leading, uh, leading to an increase uh, in water productivity overall. So we're doing a lot of research, and I, and I didn't want to show you um, what we're doing on the mechanisms because I'm not sure quite yet what's going on. But what I'm sure of, is it's not just a soil-centric um, impact. Plants respond dynamically to the shift in soil health. Rhizosphere communities are different. Rooting depth is different. So we do have this interaction between the plant and the soil in, in, in these systems. And so when we were playing in Scott and Jack's field um, uh, last summer, uh, I was roaming the field with Scott and Scott told me, I don't understand why I don't have any leaf hopper. I don't have leaf hopper, I don't have bead curly top virus, and Jack across the road has a lot of hopper and bead curly top. Um, what's going on? So, well, well, the same variety, same planting date, you're just across the road. Maybe it has something to do with soil health and this ability of soil to suppress uh, pests, which is very well known for soil-borne disease, way less for um, herbivores. So we took a leaf uh, from Scott's field and uh, Jake's field, bring it back to the lab, grew some leaf hopper, which is not easy for a plant scientist, <laughs> and uh, asked the leaf hopper carrying the bit curly top virus to choose between those two leaves. And um, they prefer to set up on Jake's uh, tomato leaves. So they go preferably to the conventionally grown uh, plant. Couldn't believe it, repeated the experiment 10 times, uh, still happening, still couldn't believe it. So went to three other farms, same pattern, three other bird farms, same pattern except that the funk brother, but it was kind of a funky side. Um, so um, we're like, what is going on? So we started to play in the lab and we're like, well, wh what aspect of soil health could be involved? And so we started to extract a soil slurry to be able to separate the biological and the chemical from, uh, from the physical. When we applied the soil slurry, to soil slurry from those two soils onto uh, tomatoes, uh, we still had uh, the effect and the leaf hopper still preferred the conventionally grown leaf. Means that something is going on with soil microbes. So we autoclave the soil slurry, slurry. let's kill those microbes. Turns out that we lost the effect. So it seems that uh, soil microbes and, and, and community composition uh, are very important uh, to mediate uh, a resistance to herbivore. So what's going on in the plant? So we measured um, uh, different uh, plant hormones and defense hormone, and we found that Scott had higher, Scott's plants had higher level of salicylic acid, and when you kill those microbes, you lose the effects as well. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we've since then sampled 10 more fields um, and uh, we are playing in the lab with different filters, we're sequencing the microbes and we're trying to see using multivariate analysis what are the driver and the main management practices which are instrumental to build up resilience to uh, leafhopper and the bit curly top virus, the, the vector. So, Yes, healthy soil provide ecosystem services which are critical to build resilience um, and decrease vulnerability to a lot of stresses which might happen simultaneously um, in the field. We're looking into uh, the mechanisms because they, they remain quite elusive. 
Now, if we think about our scale of diversification, uh, this is across a biodiversity carbon input and its impact for them to meet our mitigation goals, we were still pretty low on the diversification spectrum. We're no teal, cover crops, but we were not really pushing the limits that agroforestry is. And the policy environment in California uh, and our landscape was started to be very conducive to, to build up and, and look into this much more diverse system. So we set up on a quest to uh, uh, identify diversi more diversified farming system in California, which led to uh, getting off the ground this California Agroforestry Network, which has two members, my colleague and I. Um, uh, so <laughs> it's new <laughs> since last week. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, and um, so we went around and uh, uh, got a, a team of uh, talented, engaged undergrad to kind of find some growers which are, who are pushing the limits. Uh, we found growers growing cover crop in vineyards and orchards, some growers growing uh, leafy greens and tomatoes under walnut eggplants uh, under, um, I'm not sure what that tree is. Um, and some multi-story cropping systems on diversified s s small farms. And one um, of uh, the systems that came coming up are systems where livestock is, is, is integrated. Um, we found uh, grazing on crop residues, especially in Northern California, uh, grazing on cover crop within cash crop rotation, uh, pasture in irrigated pasture in rotation, and grazing of understory vegetation in perennial system. Mind you, those are not very common, but we, we did find some growers um, uh, who, are interested, who are integrating livestock. And one of the most prominent system was actually uh, uh, grazing in vineyards. Uh, this is um, um, uh, grazing a thousand acre at Bonterra Organic Vineyard. You can see the sheep roaming around. So this has burned during the wildfire, um, but uh, sheep are actually grazing still um, as I speak. Um, so we set up a, a small group of people and um, uh, basically a, a three very um, uh, novel growers, uh, Shannon Reach, uh, Robert Sinsky Vineyards, uh, the Napa RCDs, and uh, two of my colleagues at Boston University and Community Alliance with Family Farmers. And we decided to study the impacts of uh, sheep grazing on soil health and, and other socioeconomic out outcome. When you talk to growers um, who use sheep in their vineyards, they, they will tell you the advantage are mostly operational. It helps terminate the cover crop, it helps control suckers uh, coming out um, uh, in, in the spring, so de decreasing labor cost, and also help uh, manage under the vine uh, for weeds, which is very difficult to do mechanically. Now, this was very anecdotal, a lot of uncertainties, um, and um, other ecosystem services are unknown, socioeconomics uh, outcomes are unknown. So I went and looked for funding to do that, which is not a simple task. Um, and um, uh, Actually, the sheep growers were interested and said, well, we want more sheep grazing in vineyard, but we don't know what it does. So we're going to give you money, a little bit of money, to get this, to get this going. Um, what did studies uh, showed in the past? Well, we have very little literature on the topic. Um, uh, one, uh, one of the most relevant uh, studies looking at different cover crops, fertilization management, <laughs> and uh, different harvesting regime, grazing at two different times uh, or on grain straw in, in the vineyard showed some additional benefits of grading under story compared to, to just cover crop. Uh, mainly uh, uh, increase available P, increase in water soluble carbon, and higher moisture retention. So um, we started this project um, uh, a couple months ago. Um, we are interested in quantifying the impact of sheep grazing into vineyard systems on soil health, soil carbon pool, and long-term sequestration. 
assess the benefit for input use, but also stress resilience. I was fortunate enough to find some growers who've been grazing their vineyard for 10 years and who, has ag who have agreed for me to do some deficit irrigation trials so we can still push the boundaries a little bit and look at resilience. Um, we also want to identify trade-off for production and soil fertilities soil fertility, and then uh, through collaboration with a very talented socioeconomic Rachel Garrett at, at University of Boston, look at economic performance and grower perception to really understand the main barriers to adoption. Um, so we can feedback the information to policy support to, to inform policy program. Um, we're doing a survey approach, so surveying in the landscape, some paired site, but also setting up a long-term trial. Again, those long-term trials are very, very important. If I, if I start grazing for two years, am I going to see the benefits? Probably not. We need to keep this going five, 10 years, 20 years. So um, we um, are setting up a long-term trial at the Wichita Creek Sustainable Demonstration Vineyards across a long-term management gradient which has already been established. So there's 20 years of till, no till, compost, no compost, and natural vegetation versus improved, improved forage. So we're going to overlay sheep grazing um, on top. Um, we think that manure and urine deposition coupled with additional crop and forage residue, this grazing and, and increase in uh, resource allocation to the roots, coupled with reduced soil disturbance, will increase biomass and diversity of soil microbes and in turn impact the physical protection mechanisms and formation of soil organic matter, um, which with impact on soil fertility, nitrogen retention, increased water conservation, erosion and long-term carbon sequestration. And I am um, emphasizing long-term carbon sequestration because of <coughs> the next step of things we're trying to do with this project, um, which is adding value to the wool uh, based on the carbon sequestration potential of this sheep grazing. Um, this wool through the fiber shed uh, is being uh, trademarked a climate beneficial. We just signed a memorandum of understanding with North Face. You can now buy your California beanie made out of the wool of the sheep, which has been grazing in those vineyards. Uh, we're putting a carbon cost um, on, on this uh, uh, piece of textiles to grow value for wool producer across the textile industry. Um, this, in turn, ah, uh, will help intensify grazing in cropping system by supporting grower. A percentage of the total sale of those climate beneficial wool from North Face is going back to uh, growers and uh, grazers uh, for implementation of, of uh, grazing into cropping systems. So we're already trying to engage the consumers. There was. There were a, a very high demand for, uh, clim for, for climate beneficial uh, garments. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to um, uh, put a carbon uh, value to that. Um, so in conclusion, we have uh, current trends in California that provide an unprecedented opportunity to develop more integrated, diversified system. We have more perennial in our landscape. The drought uh, and shifted conservation practices have incentivized rangeland conversion to cropland. Um, this is the, 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 this portion here. Rangeland is mostly being transformed into vine um, and orchard crops. Um, it very complements other climate uh, beneficial practices. And we have the development of a service-based animal grazing. Um, so we're playing matchmaker right now to get this uh, going. And the new regulatory context is, is very um, appropriate too. But we need to shape a research agenda to develop best management practices. Uh, we need to work more on design of this appropriate in, um, um, fostering spatial and temporal inter interaction. Um, taking a systems approach, most of the time I find myself, uh, I find that I I'm too narrow. I need to look at the system, at the scale at which growers take decision. Um, uh, we can help address some of the challenge inherent to developing more diverse and, and managing more biodiverse systems through grower network. Um, and we definitely need to work 
on uh, the implication of integrated crop livestock system on food safety. I chose to work in vineyards so I don't have to worry about it, but at some point we're gonna have to look closely at, at those issues of food safety, integrated fertility management, are the crop and breed of animals and system design adapted to those integrated systems? Um, is there some potential trade-off for soil health? I'm thinking of compaction, um, uh, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So the aim is to crea create some climate smart production system that sequester carbon, reduce nitrous oxide emission, adapt, to re adapt uh, and build up resilience. Soil ecosystem services are the basis for improvements thanks to the co-benefits they provide. And we think that those little guys can help. Um, with that, thank you.